personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hey everyone, this is Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Resistance Library Podcast, brought to you by Ammo.com. And today we're going to talk about gun background checks. And of course, we have Sam Jacobs frothing and waiting to jump in. Now, Sam, I don't like gun background checks because they make it slightly less convenient for me to buy shit, or rather, a lot of guns. Um, You know, like, this is one of those things where I want to be, like, even-handed, but also just don't think that there should be any restrictions whatsoever on people owning guns. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I, I think I, I think I'm going to, before I even get in anything, I'm just going to give the blanket statement up front that I think gun, but gun background checks suck and are unconstitutional and we shouldn't have them like at all. Here, here. Um, especially when the phony president's crackhead son is allowed to, um, you know, fill out this form and get a gun when he is a active crackhead. Um, yeah. Well, to use the old chestnut, it only stops law abiding citizens from getting right. guns. Right. It's very, very, I mean, people do, tr- people do try, you know, try and buy where they're like, Oh, I don't think I'm going to pass, but I'll go in and fill it out. And they don't get, you know, get approved. I was in there once <laughs> I was in a gun store once and a guy failed his next check and he's, he's walking out and he turns to the guy and goes, Oh yeah, my ex girlfriend's got a restraining order against me. Is that why? And he's uh, like, "That'll do it." Yeah, and he's like, "Sir, you legally can't even be in this store right now." And the guy's <laughs> like, "Oh, for real?" <laughs> it's just such a like weird, you know, interaction to watch happen. But yeah, I just like, I don't, I don't think that we need background checks. I don't think background checks stop. I don't want to say background checks. Background checks don't stop anyone who's going to commit a violent crime from getting a gun but like Mm -hmm. when they do it's such a it's it's such an outlier that it's like it's statistically insignificant you know it is not like this is not preventing any significant amount of crime and as i'm not in the we should do absolutely anything to save even one life camp of thought um i just don't think that we should have them and we should and then and in fact we didn't before 1968 to use that peach of a man as an example i mean if he's really intent on on hurting his ex uh, he can can get a paving stone or uh or a length of rebar there's other ways to do it there is a lyric from british rapper dizzy rascal and it is Kick off your door. I ain't got a 44. I'll have to settle for a long metal bar. That's which, exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. Right. Also, you know, worth noting for the uh, benefit of this gentleman that uh, it is very easy to get a restraining order um, in this country, which is another like reason why I don't think that we should have gun background checks because, you know, if you have like one vengeful ex-girlfriend it is not terribly difficult for her to get a restraining order against you if you have a pending restraining order i think it goes on your uh record for the next background check system i mean in the 30s like this is obviously it's a million years ago in the 30s you could like walk into a drugstore and buy dynamite um Mm -hmm. because you needed to blow up a stump you know and like if i if i had a 10 year old i could probably send him there with a note that's like you know, buying, buying uh, dynamite for my dad and, you know, he'll go in and they'll go, Oh, little, little Jimmy Jacobs, you know, oh, we know, we know Sam, like, don't worry about it. He's a good kid. Just, you know, hand him some dynamite and off he goes. And like, I'm sure that that was a common occurrence in the United States in an earlier era. Um, gun background checks debut in 1968. Most adults in the United States were allowed to purchase firearms without any kind of interference from the state. Guns were available. <sighs> you could walk into any store, you know, hardware store, sporting goods store. They were kind of everywhere. Um, mail order 
catalogs were another common source. Lee Harvey Oswald got his uh, the rifle that he shot President Kennedy with out of a yeah. Wasn't order. that Italian Milserp from World War II? It was Italian Milserp, and wow, how weird that he bought a gun that was so easily traced at a time when you could buy a gun literally anywhere that was totally untraceable. Very strange. You were not allowed to purchase firearms if you had been convicted of a felony. I assume that was mostly enforced on the honor system. Uh, if there's no kind of, you know, background check going on, but I would imagine that the penalties for being a felon with a firearm were probably deterring about as many people as the next check. Maybe the next check wins by a little bit, but I don't think a lot of people were going Oh, let me risk 15 years in prison for being a felon with a firearm. I think they just said, well, it sucks that I can't own a gun. Hmm. Um, or they, or, you know, the other, the third option is they bought one and they kept it and they were peaceful with it and no one ever knew anything about it. You know, that's the, like, the third possibility is the felon said, well, I'm going to chance it. And he just keeps it under his mattress you know, in case somebody shows up at his house and we never hear about it. Um, I think that the whole felons can't own firearms thing. I, I that, like, that's how far I go on this. Like, I don't, I don't know that I think that prohibiting uh felons from owning firearms once they've been released and have ended their parole conditions i I don't know that i think that's uh, uh, constitutional i know a lot of people are probably gonna object to that felon is such a broad category there's too many unconstitutional crimes which you can become a felon for breaking uh you know if you you don't pay your taxes or your child support the forfeit your right to bear arms yeah i mean there was a you know there was the case that they talked about uh when they did the amy Barrett confirmation, and it was like you ruled that a that a felon was allowed to have a gun, and it was like, well, he was convicted of mail fraud, so <laughs> I didn't really see why how it would be dangerous for him to own a firearm. I, here's here's what I'll say: two things. Number one, I think it's weird that um, when people have served their sentence that and and keep in mind, like, I do not think that most people in prison are just, like, decent human beings who are ready to turn their life around the second they get out of prison. This is not my – I do not have a bleeding-heart liberal view of most people in prison. I think most people Did in prison ever, are, are irredeemable sociopaths, right? Like, you ever watch The Simpsons? The Simpsons where Krusty does a Johnny Cash-style concert at the prison? No. Is, is, is Sideshow Bob there? I don't know if this is pre or post Sideshow Bob's Fall from Grace, but at the end of his concert, Krusty says, the greatest folks in the world are prison folks. And the whole crowd cheers for him, they being prison folks, of course. Um, I, I, so we're having some technical sound difficulties, and I love that the, the joke was what uh, our program chose to edit out of you talking. So I'll oh. never know what was said. <laughs> oh. Jesus, should we should we try reconnecting or should we just soldier through nah, it? No, it's just soldier on because it's recording you. It's recording me. All right, and, you know. listeners at home, my joke, my reference wasn't funny. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm sure they're going to hear it. I just didn't hear it. Um, oh, then it was very funny. Don't tell Sam what I said. It was at his expense. So, so yeah, I mean, basically, like, I don't. It's weird to me. Without a Pollyannish view that everybody who's everybody who's in prison is going to hop right out and go, oh, I'm going to get my life together. They are not, yeah. for the most part. But I just feel like when somebody has served their sentence, um, it is a fairly fundamental tenet of Western jurisprudence that when someone has served their sentence, that their sentence is done, and we do not continue to punish them or restrict their rights i in theory i'm against um you know i'm against restrictions on felons voting but we'll get rid of felon mm-hmm. voting restrictions when we get rid of felon gun restrictions i think is you know i'm 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 willing to do horse trading on that um you know so there's like there's that thing going on and there's also what you talk about or just like you know i i don't you know, if we want to, if the, the Barrett's position was basically that if you are, have you been convicted of a felony, that that alone does not disqualify you from owning a firearm. Yeah. Um, and I, and I'm, it's, you know, that like, okay, sure. You know, we're going to start like 
reviewing people and go this this specific guy should not have a gun you know like that i'm okay with uh um, yeah but then you know you get into the trouble obviously violent crimes maybe maybe not have gun but if they count possession of one eighth of marijuana as a violent crime it undoes all the logic you could take from that but then you you know you have the romantic jean valjean ideal of an ex-convict yeah so i do not, uh, I do not have is. that like i don't like I even like you know guys don't even I, for the most part like domestic abusers don't see the inside of prison for the most part and i'm just like domestic abuser plus gun is like a murder waiting to happen you know Mm -hmm. but like that we're gonna just blanket remove felons ability to own firearms because they're felons like even there's stuff like okay vehicular homicide vehicular homicide's horrible somebody died does that mean that you, yeah. you shouldn't be able to own a gun? I don't really think so. You know, maybe not a car, but a gun seems tangential. Right? <laughs> I mean, like, you know, guy a guy drove drunk and killed someone with his car. That's horrible. He did something really bad uh, that cost somebody their life. But I'm not the connection between that and whether or not it's safe for him to own a gun. You know, I'm I'm, I'm just not seeing it. So background checks. Do go back before 1968. 1968 is when the federal uh, background checks are introduced. Of course, background checks or their historic equivalent were frequently used to strip uh, freed black Americans of their right to own firearms. Uh, black Americans in general, after you know all the freed ones had had died out and it was just free without the D uh, that was a common way. I mean, everybody listening to this probably has at least once in their life come across the Martin Luther King wasn't allowed to get a concealed carry permit in Mississippi chestnut because Mississippi at the time was a may issue state. And if you were Martin Luther King or you were black, you were probably not getting, um, you were probably not getting a permit. So, mm. uh, there's a sort of noxious history of this that I think is worth keeping in our minds, not in some, you know, gosh, weren't the Democrats bad 150 years ago kind of thing, but in a gosh, Democrats historically like to leverage racist policies to get their other policies working. Um, who against whom do they currently direct their racism? This is a this is an important question to ask because uh, that's who they will be trying to take guns away from using these types of laws in the future. The Federal Firearms Act of 1938, boo hiss, was the first to restrict the the sales of firearms. I mean, this is the thing that like people don't get. People hear, oh, you could you could get a gun at you know, whatever you could order a gun, you could order a gun through the mail and they're thinking mm-hmm. like, you know, a five shot revolver, a break action shotgun or bolt action rifle is like, that's what you could buy. No, you could have a Thompson delivered to your house. Yeah. The Corby days. No, I agree. I totally agree. Uh, oh. you know, I, I, I don't, um, I don't believe that laws were, this is this is probably my most libertarian my most libertarian views are on the first and second amendment there should be absolutely no restrictions whatsoever on freedom of speech or peaceful ownership of firearms and shooting an intruder in your home is a peaceful use of firearms so i i'm against laws that prohibit you from being able to order a thompson submachine gun and get it delivered to your home with no questions asked i just i don't i don't have any problem with that um and i don't think most people listening to this do either when we really begin to think about it um i think that the whole like automatic weapons thing is like it's it's the beginning of you know fuddom i mean everybody has at least once encountered the old guy who's like ar-15 what do you need all that for yeah, so or to use their wonderful shit, term. Grandpa, I just want it. A, a fully automatic weapon. I love that term. Um, I know guys who own, you know, they're stamped and everything. 
but I know guys mm-hmm. who own automatic weapons and like, yeah, they rule. They're awesome. They're fun to shoot. Ah. Um, they're good times. And then, you know, you, you encounter that counter argument. Oh, then should people be allowed to own nuclear weapons too? And I say, hell yes. Just, but for hunting purposes only. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing about, I mean, that, that argument is like, I, I don't think people should be able to own nuclear weapons. Um, you know but, what, if they can afford one, they can do more damage in other ways, probably. Yeah, I'm not, like, that's kind of the thing, is I'm not, okay, so make it legal for private citizens to own nuclear weapons. I don't think there's going to, I don't think there's going to be much of a market for that. Yeah, uh, it's going to cost so much. I mean, sure, we could sell them on ammo.com, but can you imagine the shipping insurance? The shipping would be a nightmare. Um, Six days before Thanksgiving, 1963, what we were just talking about happened. President John F. Kennedy was assassinated by Lee Harvey Oswald. Well, President Kennedy was assassinated. Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested. Lee Harvey Oswald allegedly used a Manlicker Carcano rifle chambered for a 6.5 by 52 millimeter Carcano and fitted with a telescopic sight, which, God, like, what a... (laughs) crazy he bought it from a mail order catalog so they knew right where to find him he didn't just walk into the local sporting goods store and pick one up um i do not have by the way like this is a really good this is a really good uh time to mention that like i actually i actually do not have a a a a, uh standing theory as to the kennedy assassination other than that the official story is not true and so I, you know, I don't have any specific theory. I just Lee Harvey Oswald, a lone nut killing Kennedy, is not what happened. Uh, there were a number of high-profile assassinations over the next five years. This is why they had the Select Committee on Assassinations. February twenty-first, nineteen sixty-five, Malik Al Shabazz, commonly known as Malcolm X, um, who I love, was assassinated by three members of the Nation of Islam who rushed him on stage during a speech in Harlem with a 12-gauge sawed-off handguns chambered in 45 ACP and 9mm. Malcolm X had broken from the Nation of Islam, openly, uh, not only openly critical of its leader, Elijah Muhammad, but was exposing basically how this was like the nation of Islam basically exists. Well, I'm not, I'm not even going to say anything about that. Um, I'm just going to say that he left the nation of Islam and criticized it. Cause boy, I do not want them mad at me. Uh, April 4th, no. n- 1968, Martin no. Luther King was assassinated by, well, le- again, allegedly assassinated by escaped convict, James Earl Ray using a 30 six caliber rifle in Memphis. Um, he had mm-hmm. broken out Remington of... model 760. Yeah. How do you know this? I, I wrote about it once. Okay. And, uh, well about the 30 odd six particularly. And just that just, uh, that popped up, not some kind of assassination studier, but, uh, stuck with me for some reason. Um, Ray consistently denied his, his guilt in the Martin yeah, even King. King's own son forgave him and said that he didn't do it, right? I don't I don't know about that specifically, and I know very, very little about the King assassination other than that. Um, well, what I know about the King assassination is that James Earl Ray maintained his innocence until his death, which, you know, that's who knows what, you know. That this does not convince me of his innocence. Let's put it that way. No, it is odd behavior for a political assassination. These people, yes, that is want that, to take. They want well, to take credit well, for it. It's kind. Like, it's kind of weird that he didn't take credit for it, but you know, prisons are full of innocent men. <laughs> you know, like you know yeah. what everyone in prison has in common? They didn't do it. So, a huge grain of salt on that. But again, you know, Malcolm X assassinated by uh, three members of the nation of Islam, possibly with God knows who else, the Robert F. Kennedy assassination, which was the third uh, I, that I know, I, I know even less about than the King assassination. Also 
seems weird. Um, and the Kennedy assassination, which I know quite, quite, I'm not an expert, but you know, I know, I know a fair bit about the Kennedy assassination and how weird it is and how the story doesn't add up. And I kind of just like, there's a big cloud of suspicion hanging over the official stories of 1960s assassinations in general for me. So Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, anyway, that was one of the, that and the emergence of the black Panthers were really what led to the gun control act of 1968. Of course, the Mulford act in California was Ronald Reagan's, uh, big gun control act, trying to get guns, specifically trying to get guns out of the hands of the black Panthers. But the gun control act of 1968 was specifically intended to keep firearms out of the hands of those who are not legally entitled to possess them because of age, criminal background, or incompetence, uh, they mean you know mental incompetence not just you're bad with guns there by the way <laughs> the gun control act of 1968 was the federal government placing restrictions on the sale of firearms across state lines it expanded the prohibited persons who were not allowed to purchase or own a firearm and gun purchases became illegal for those who were convicted of a non-business related felony is a weird way to put that found to be mentally incompetent or users of illegal substances. Huh? So if you kill someone while you're working, it doesn't count. (laughs) No. Well, yeah, I guess you're right. I guess you're right. It's just, uh, anyway, it's the whole thing is so kind of arbitrary that we should, you know, and then it's got the, this is when they introduced, uh, does this actually, when they introduced the form? No, they introduced the form later. But you used to have to, you had to, wait, no, it is the, it is when they introduced the form, uh, the form, what is it? 4473. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 40, God, I can't believe I finally have that memorized for ATF, uh, form 4473 is, I don't, I don't know the specific date and I want to know when they actually introduced the form. So give me one second here. The questionnaire mentioned in 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 regards to the gun control act of 1968 sounds very very much like the form 4473 we're just going to say that the you know came out in around 1968 and if that means 1974 then i'm comfortable with that and if i'm completely wrong always uh please let me know at sam jacob 1776 on twitter are you a convicted felon are you a fugitive from justice do you smoke crack these are the questions that are on the 4473. Um, it actually asks you about controlled substances, but not crack and specific, not crack specifically. I just like to reference the fact that uh, Joe Biden's son is a crackhead who has firearms that he illegally obtained. Really, any chance that I can get. 1972 Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives was formed. That was formed allegedly to control illegal sales and illegal use of firearms they mostly just used it to hassle law-abiding gun owners until the gun control act of 1986 which for the most part was horse trading this is when they they didn't ban fully automatic weapons but they did not nah. make them much harder. Exorbitantly own. expensive. And they're less yeah. expensive than you think. They're less expensive than you think because everyone's like, oh man, fully automatic weapons are just so, so expensive. I'll never be able to have one. And it's like, well, if you don't want a it's Thompson true. or an M16. They, they want the Thompson and the M16, right? right? That's it. If you, yeah. you want a Thompson or an M16, yeah, you're never going to have that, dude. You know what? I'm never going to have a 1966 Chevy 2 Super Sport either. Um, oh, but you know, I can go out. Sad. I could go out tomorrow and buy a and buy a you know an eighty six uh, Nova for nothing. And it's the same deal. You want to get some weird off brand Israeli fully automatic weapon? It is not going to cost you anywhere near what a Thompson or an M sixteen is. So they're still like they're not totally prohibitively expensive. Like you can, you can get one um, legally with the stamp and yada yada yada. But the thing I want to point out about that is that. You know, I think that 
I know this is a thing that sometimes people like to use against Reagan. I'm not opposed. I'm not a St. Reagan guy. I'm happy to criticize Reagan where I think he was wrong and did things that were not good for the country. But I actually think that, that, that this was a solid that Reagan did because it's like he basically tr- did horse trading where he said, OK, guess what? I'll ban this gun that like almost nobody owns if you start leaving regular gun owners alone. Mm-hmm. And they were like, OK, you know, that's a, we'll, we'll, <laughs> that's that's the deal. And it's like you like being able to buy ammo through the mail because you couldn't do that before 1986. Between 1968 we, we and do 19, like that here. Yeah. Between 1968 and 1986, one of the things that, that the ATF would come and knocking on your door for was buying ammo through the mail. So, you know, I, I think that this is actually like, uh, you know, again, going back to my totally absolutist view of the Second Amendment, this is intact. But living, you know, being a being a pragmatic person who lives in the real world, I'm going to say that if Dutch is going <laughs> to Dutch is going to take my automatic weapons away that I don't own in exchange for making it significantly more difficult for the ATF to breathe down my neck because they found out my name, um, I'm going to I'm going to give up that Thompson. So the 1986 gun control act i actually think the 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 1986 gun control act the actual name of it is the firearms firearm owners protection act and i actually think that that's the much more apt name for it like people have no idea how difficult it was to be a gun owner between 1968 and 1986 it was it was not a good time to be a gun owner in the united states so the brady act is what we have to thank for the Nix system that we all know and love. That was launched in 1998, and that is the current the current standard mandated by the Brady Handgun Prevention Act, Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act of 1993, um, launched in full by the FBI. On November 30th, 1998, the NIX is used by firearms dealers to check if you are eligible to purchase a firearm. There is a physical building. It's in Clarksburg, West Virginia. It is used by 30 states and five districts, as well as the District of Columbia, to check the backgrounds of those who want to purchase a firearm. I'm sure literally everyone listening to this show has filled one of these out at one time or another. States that do not use them have their own background check system. Uh, I am not opposed to, let me put, let me put this the way that I actually mean it. I believe that, that state firearms restrictions are, are, or can be constitutional. Um, I do think that, States have the right to do things that the federal federal government does not. One of those is, you know, setting up their own gun background check. I'm not saying I would be in favor of doing it. I'm just saying that state government's doing it. You know, I would way rather buy a gun in a state that isn't using NICs. I'll tell you that. So there is that. Who, according to the National Crime Information Center, who run NICs, is allowed to, well, who's not allowed to own a firearm, convicted of a crime punishable by imprisonment of more than a year or more, fugitive from justice, user or addict of controlled substance, Hunter Biden, adjudicated as a mental defective or been committed to a mental institution, that'd be Joe Biden, illegal (laughs) aliens, aliens admitted to the U.S. under a non-immigrant visa, discharged from the United States armed forces under dishonorable conditions. I find that to be possibly the weirdest one on the list. Renounce your American citizenship subject to a court order restraining you from interactions with an intimate partner or child or a conviction of domestic violence. I did not know that that was specifically pulled out. And of of the list, that's probably the one I'm least uncomfortable with. Um, which one? The, the wife beaters. I don't know. The, like wife beaters owning guns. You know, like convicted wife beaters owning guns. That doesn't sound like a good idea. 
Like that actually does sound like the worst possible idea I can conceive of. Um, yeah. Way more than, you know, even way more even than the president's crackheads. It, it should be moot. It should be a son. moot point because guys who beat their wives maybe should be rendered incapable of, you know, eating their meals through anything but a straw, let alone holding, holding operate a firearm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, I see steamrollers as playing an important uh, role in that little offshoot of justice, but we digress. So the Knicks, over 300 million background checks have been completed. I'm amazed that it's that low, but it is. And I guess because there's only 30 states on there, and they're also, you know, California is probably a Knicks state, whereas... Mm -hmm. You know, Arizona isn't. I don't know that Arizona is not, but you get the point I'm trying to make. 1.3 million denials. Nix is available uh, 17 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year, except Christmas. So I can't buy an AK-74 on Christmas? Not on Christmas, man. Sorry. George Washington is rotating at 100 revolutions per minute. Yeah, thanks, Obama. So this Creep. is the, yeah it is is the for, the firearms transaction record 4473 um it needs all your info you've probably filled one out once the form has been completed there's a 1-800 number for Nix or you can use the online system god i can't imagine that anybody picks up the phone and calls the 800 number for Nix sounds like a nightmare <laughs> 90 almost 90 over 90% of cases results are basically immediate um, I've been, I got approved like when COVID was big and there was this, people were waiting like 72 hours from the Knicks and I got mine in like mm -hmm. 10 minutes. So I think part of it is kind of random. Once the yeah. approval. If anything, hey, here's, here's something. It keeps you in the store longer. I almost bought more guns in those 10 minutes. I had to wait when I last got my shotgun. So you know, man, I that. wish that, I wish that that was my, I wish that was my luxury when I'm buying guns but when i when i buy guns i i don't go cheap and so i ain't buying more than one at a time that's not true my huh. ar was cheap but for the most part i'm not really buying i'm not really a cheap gun guy because like you know need need it to work so you just get a lot of cheap guns and keep yeah, going through true. them until one works. Carry carry six carry six cheap guns around at all times. Yeah, I have a golf bag full of shotguns next to my bed. God, do you really? No, that would be insane. Oh man, just uh, just one. Oh. Yes, like like a normal person. So if there's a denial, which is only about two percent of all background checks, um, the retailer can't sell it to you you can submit a request to receive the reason for the denial the most common of which is a felony conviction a lot of these guys do are doing try and buy which is like i don't know i mostly just it's not even like i think hey go after those guys there's some huge criminal menace that we need to take care of i just more things yeah did you think the fugitive gonna, from justice one is, is really crazy because imagine going into a place with security cameras and filling out your name on a form, then getting shocked that you can't walk out with your gun. It's, yeah, it's like it's a bad very, move if you're a fugitive. I mean, I guess there weren't uh, omnipresent security cameras at that time, at the time the law was drafted. Yeah, that's fair. There is an appeal process. You can do it online or you can send it to the FBI. Uh, you would also need to be fingerprinted to move along if you are filing an appeal. You need to run a background check anytime you buy a gun from a retailer. Um, it's basically anybody with an FFL. They're legally mandated to complete it for every firearm sold to somebody who doesn't own an FFL. It doesn't matter if you buy it at a brick and mortar shop or gun show online through a magazine. Um, is that true that you need, there's no, there's no background check at a gun show for a long arm anyway, is there? Uh, not to my knowledge. No. Is there, I was going to say, I don't, I don't know. I've, I've never bought a gun at a gun show. Them. Bought them from guys in parking lots. Private seller sells fewer than four, four firearms during any 12 month period. 
that was the original in 1968, 1986. Private seller. See, this is a really good example of of like why the 1986 Firearm Owners Protection Act is not really a gun control law. And I'm sure a bunch of people are gonna, like gonna hit the roof over me saying that, but it's not, yeah. it's not a it's not a gun control law. The can they, federal... can they tweet me if they're angry? <laughs> the gun control my Act Twitter, 19... my my Twitter is at real Ethan Hawk. Just so you know. <laughs> uh, the Gun Control Act of nineteen sixty eight defined private sellers as anyone who sold fewer than four firearms in a twelve month period. Okay. That was the law until the 1986 Firearm Owners Protection Act deleted that restriction and bit just basically said, do you sell guns for a living? If no, you don't need to fill out a bunch of paperwork to sell them. There, so yeah, as far as I know, the federal government does not have any kind of background check for private transfers of any kind. And in three states, they're required for handguns only at, b- between private sellers and in another 14 states all purchases have some kind of background check tied to them and they these are pretty much the states you'd think that they would be i don't really feel the need to to name them um yeah that's about the, that's about the short and skinny of it on the background checks now what i want to know is well that i didn't answer the background checks i've literally only bought long arms at a gun show so do long arms background check? Is that you need to get a background check to get a shotgun? Editor, fill up this this yeah, dead air with, take, with take, mid-eye take. music. Play royalty free free mid-eye music now, please. Here we go. Let's go to the FBI's website. Cause like I believe them. Um yes, it appears that you need a background check to buy long arms? Really? Really? I'm like, I just, I can't believe that. I'm, huh. I'm, I'm astonished. And I have literally only ever bought long arms from private sellers. So that's why I have no idea. Very um, interesting. But I just cannot believe that you need a background check to own a shotgun. God, I guess that's I guess that's the case. Wild. That is that is news to me. Um gun show loophole. Let's talk about that gun show loophole. Uh as you know, liberals call it. There yes. is no gun show loophole. It's just there's a bunch of private sellers somewhere. Um I have been unable to purchase a gun at a gun show because I was buying it from an I was sat down and was like, yeah, I want to buy this gun. And we get to the part where I'm supposed to hand him money. And he goes, all right, just fill out your form for 4473. And I go, huh? And he's like, I'm a FFL dude. Like I, yeah, you got to fill out a form. Um, hmm. And I went home gunless because he oh. was the only one who had what I showed up there for. So if you show up, to a gun show and go to a gun dealer who's at a gun show, they're going to give you a background check. If you show up and buy from a private seller, you don't need a background check. This is Mm -hmm. no different than any other gun transaction. I would estimate at the average gun show that I would say about three out of four of every guy selling a gun at a gun show is an FFL. Um, you know, obviously gun shows very wildly, but the gun shows I've been to, it's about 75% FFL dealers and 25% yahoos with guns. And we love yahoos. So that's not a diss by any means, but the short oh, version yeah, is that yahoos are a huge part of our client base. Yeah. Yahoos, yahoos are like, you know, not only are you, not only are yahoos are bread and butter, but like mm-hmm. I am a yahoo. I am most certainly a Yahoo, a kook, if you will. Definitely a bit of a kook. So, you know, <laughs> that's the lay of the land at a uh, at a at a gun show. Is like most of those guys have are FFL dealers, and you're gonna have to fill out the form. So, the it was 0.7 percent of convicted criminals purchased their firearms at gun shows, 
according to the Bureau of Justice statistics. So this is just this is another thing that like this is not a problem. This is just not not a real problem. It's an invented, made up problem to take your guns away from you. There's mm-hmm. an extensive study conducted in 2018 by U.S. Davis and Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Ten years following California's comprehensive background checks, gun homicides and suicides were not impacted. A similar study published in July of that year found that gun violence did not increase with the repeal of comprehensive background checks. Some studies have shown that background checks reduce violence. A 2015 study found that requiring Connecticut handgun owners to go through a background check led to a 40% decline in gun homicides and suicides over a 10 year period. I, I just flat out don't believe that. I mean, that just doesn't, um, well, I believe that the gun homicide and suicide rate went down that I believe. I do not believe <laughs> very hard to control for other data in a study like that. Yeah. I want to know what to... else happened over that 10 year period that might have, uh, yeah. ended gun violence in the state. There, yeah, even if it just increased to the point where people stopped reporting it, it would have affected data collection. You also right. got to be very careful of the people collecting the data. Remember what Mark Twain said there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. Yeah, I mean, I, I like most intelligent people. Anytime I see a statistic, I have you know 20 questions about what it means, where they got it from, etc. And I think that that's the grain of salt to kind of take with any statistic. Um, 77% of inmates in state prisons with firearms crimes received their firearm through theft to the black market, a drug dealer on the street or family and friends. So, so 77% of straight state prisoners associated with firearms crimes w- were not, not only like they weren't stopped by Nick's, they just they just flew, completely flew under its radar because criminals like if you're a criminal why would you even maybe if you're an incredibly stupid criminal you would try and get a firearm from an ffl dealer but you know i don't think even the average criminal is that dumb and i don't think the average criminal is terribly smart that's why they're a criminal <laughs> but you're gonna lose our criminal it's market completely now. it's completely true though it's completely true like the um this the, this is one of my favorite uh factoids is the sweet spot for criminality in IQ, there's a mm-hmm. like I, I there's a there's a average IQ for convicted felons, and it's like you know the top of this bell chart is like real high because they all cluster around 85 IQ, and it's because mm-hmm. 85 IQ is smart enough to know the liquor store has got a bunch of money in the drawers, not smart enough to think about the security camera. Mm-hmm. And that I think is about where your average criminal is, is like, oh, they got, you know, $10,000 in the drawer at the liquor store and I'm like, oh, well, it's, mo- it's money. It's sitting there. I guess I got a gun. I guess I'll just go get it without thinking <laughs> to the, go get it. Yeah. Without, without going through the consequences, like at all, you know, I think is, is very, very common for the criminal element. So maybe they're just dumb, but I think that the average criminal is smarter than that. Straw purchases are another one. That's illegal unless you're a Mexican gangster and uh, Obama is letting you <laughs> send your people in to get guns to commit the sell to Al Qaeda to commit terrorist acts against Eagles of Death Metal fans in France. Uh, f- yeah, straw purchases we talked uh, about significantly on, and extensively on the episode about Fast and Furious, which I think is a pretty good one, and you should go check out the uh, terrorists in San Bernardino use straw purchases as well. Background checks always are a talking point after this, but there's two kinds of people who do this, you know, hardened criminals who are not going to pass a background check. know they're not going to pass a background check, get their guns from somebody else. The other type of person is a law abiding citizen who goes nutso like the Virginia Tech shooter is a good example. Uh, Cho and, Sung Hui. Yes. What was the name of the what was the name of the Simon's Rock shooter? 
You got that? Simon you got Brock. That? Simon Brock. No, that one's not stuck up in my fly trap. I I should remember his name. I remember Cho Sung Hui specifically because at the time I was dating a Korean girl. And when the news broke, she went off into a tirade about how insane and violent white people are. And then with almost comedic, <laughs> with almost comedic timing, they released the killer's identity. And uh, <laughs> yeah, she really ate crow over that one. Um, the guy that I'm thinking of, his name is Wayne Lowe. I remember him because, first of all, this happened in 1992, and such things were not as prominent in the media, and so it was a way bigger deal. He also was wearing a t-shirt of the band Sick of It All at his hearing, which me and my little punk rocker friends all thought was really cool. <laughs> not that the shooting was cool, but like, what's the, like, whoa, that's crazy. This is 1992, dude. Like, you see a guy in some New York hardcore shirt, you take notice because it's not like I can go on the internet and Google 50 pictures of somebody wearing the shirt. Like, whoa, crazy. Somebody else has heard of the weird niche thing that I'm into. <laughs> um, here's, <laughs> the, here's, the, here's the punchline about Wayne Lowe inspiration for the 2019 feature film Cuck. For the what? Sorry, you cut out. Inspiration for the 2019 feature film Cuck. Oh, I haven't, I haven't that seen is, Cuck. I have not either, but that's one hell of a last sentence of your Wikipedia entry. Anyway, Wayne Lowe. Huh. Um, so the Virginia Tech shooter is a really good example of like another way that they don't stop. Like, they don't stop mass shootings because for the most part, Mass shootings are committed by people who've never committed a, a crime that would disqualify them from owning a firearm before. Uh, yeah, you it, don't really work your way up to mass shooting. No, it's true. You don't. You don't work your way up to mass shooting. The, Devin Kelly, who was the guy who shot up the Texas church, and he got clapped by one of the profe- pro- uh, parishioners, correct? Yes, I recall that one. Uh, he had four legally obtained firearms. And he was prohibited by law from owning them. He had a DV conviction when he was in the Air Force. He and somehow was able to purchase four firearms between 2014 and 2017. And he and he filled out a form 4473 and was approved by Nix every single time. So mm. it's not even doing the thing that it's supposed to do. The thing that it's supposed to do is prevent the guy who goes into the gun store, isn't legally allowed to own firearms, fills the form out, hands it in, and they're supposed to go, no, buddy, sorry, you you used to beat your girlfriend, you can't have guns. Well, it failed to do that. Even the (laughs) narrow scope that is its charge is a giant failure for criminal background checks. Amazing. It's and again, so plumber named Stephen staff. Williford, who legally owned an AR, and he shot the De- Devin Kelly, the Texas church shooter. So there you go. The system can be incomplete. There's also the problem with false positives. If you have a name that's similar to somebody else, it's entirely possible that you would get rejected. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this on the show or not before, but I have a friend who has to carry a document with him in uh, whenever he drives because he has he has the same name and similar identifying information as a guy who, who broke out of prison. Oh God! So, yeah. So if every oh. time he gets every time he gets pulled over by the cops, which you know isn't like every day or whatever, but is frequent enough that it sucks, I'm sure. He has, That's why I'm glad license, I have an eye patch to take a and hooks here's, for hands. Here's my notarized piece of paper saying that I am not I am not the guy who broke out of Leavenworth or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> this piece of paper permits me to not be in jail. Thank you. Yeah. The estimates from the Crime Prevention Research Center found that 93% of initial NICS denials were false positives in 2009. That was similar in 2010. That's when uh, Barack Obama stopped reporting those statistics because I'm, sh- you know, because they're embarrassing to him. So yeah, it can be appealed, but 
these guys should not have to be jumping through red tape to buy guns. The National Sports National Shooting Sports Foundation launched fixnix.org in 2013. That is their attempt to uh, I don't know if it's a reform or eliminate, but you know, Nix is not a good not only is like not only does do I re- I reject everything about this from like the from at every step of the way, right? Like I don't think that the, I don't think that we can constitutionally prohibit the vast overwhelming majority of American citizens from owning whatever firearm they want unrestricted without background check or registration. Um, mm-hmm. I do not think that criminals are going to gun stores to buy guns. I <laughs> I do not think that for the most part mass shooters have, you know, prior convictions that are going to prevent them from passing a Nix background check. I don't think that the Nix background check is worth shit anyway because of the number of false positives and the number of false negatives it gives. So like the system they put in place doesn't work just as as a system you know, take it, mm-hmm. take it at face value. It doesn't work. It doesn't do the thing that they say it's going to do. That's yeah, number one. What they say it's going to do, but it certainly creates an illusion of authority, and that's something bureaucrats and governments which overstep their boundaries are all in favor for. Yeah, the good news is we have something somewhere on. Uh, I think it may be in the ATF article. I don't know off the top of my head where it is. We have an article that talks about. You know, what do they do with all of these background check forms that you fill out? And the short answer is that they've said, it's your problem, gun shops. You guys got to keep these in order for us in case one day we show up and decide that we (laughs) decide that we want to look at them, which is like, you know, okay, cool. I hate basically any law that forces the average average American to be a bureaucrat or to do yeah. bureaucrat work for them. I hate, this is like one of the reasons why I hate the income tax. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to hate the income tax. Number one being it's theft. But yeah. the other reason is the whole, send us a form every year saying what you owe us. Well, what if I get it wrong? Uh, well, you know, we know what you owe us. And we and we you, know what you owe and we'll we know punish you, you horribly. And, and yeah. if you get it wrong, we're going to arrest you. Oh, cool. Well, I keep my 4473s in the back room next to the Tannerite primers and bowling balls. <laughs> uh, the 44, yeah, I mean, the 4473 is like, we've all filled it out. It's all, no, nobody likes it. Um, it's, it doesn't, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to finish my recap. Let's talk about gun background checks. Number one, Nick's system does not work. It doesn't work. It lets people who shouldn't have guns get them and prevents people who are allowed to have guns from having them. That is, by I think any definition of what the NIC system should be doing, if we grant that having a having a background check is a good thing, um, it is it's not doing it. It's not doing the thing that it's supposed to do. Okay. No. The existence of the NIC system is predicated on a idiotic argument that gangbangers are walking into pawn shops and buying, uh, you know, 6,000 magazine AR 47 chainsaw bayonet attachment, uh, weapons of 3d printed ghost bullets and, and, uh, yeah, fully, fully automatic, you know, High capacity bait. All this nonsense that people who know absolutely nothing about guns think is going on in this country. Um, they, this is not where this is not high where velocity criminals. bolt carrier groups. Yeah, this is not. This is not. This is not happening. Like these guys are not going into gun stores. Are are there probably some some very very low level criminals going into gun stores to to go buy guns for? Uh, for nefarious purposes and getting stopped by the next system. I'm sure that that's happened more than once in the last month. I do not think that it is. I do not think that it's significantly impeding anyone who is buying guns for illicit purposes from buying them because 
criminals who are buying guns to commit crimes know other criminals who will sell them shit like, you know, an AR-15 with no serial number on it, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, Well, that's the whole Breaking Bad. Why are they going to the gun store? They're not. They're not. (laughs) And then the third layer of it is, and I think that I want to... I, I want to I want to frame it in a very specific way. The third element of it is is that the federal government, who are currently vetting a man who murdered women and children at Waco, to decide wh- to be in charge of enforcing gun laws in this country, has absolutely no business whatsoever deciding who is legally allowed to own a firearm and who isn't. It is absolutely, completely outside of the purview of the federal government to decide who is and who is not allowed to own a firearm. Not only do they not have, in my opinion, do they not have the constitutional authority to do it, because I think that uh, make no law is pretty clear, is pretty clear and straightforward language, and I believe it was chosen precisely because it was clear and straightforward language. Uh, so th- I don't think that they have the constitutional authority to do so. But again, let's take it back one more layer. I don't think that they have the moral authority to do so. I do not think that the federal government who lets straw purchasers buy 50 cows and sell them to Mexican gangsters has any moral authority whatsoever to tell you what weapons you should be allowed to own. And I, and you know what? If you like accidentally backed your car over a kid and killed him and went to prison for it, I still think that that's true because I don't, I don't think that like the federal government should be unilaterally creating entire classes of people like felons and saying, we're not going to give guns to them. Because the entire federal apparatus is staffed by people who would be felons were they not wearing the colors of the federal government or a federal law enforcement agency. So, you know, there's, there's no moral authority. There's no moral authority there for them to do it, regardless of the constitutional authority. I mean, it's here, you know, like background checks are here. We all got to put up with them. It's all, a, it, you know, it is, it is what it is. But. I just I think at every every step of the way it's nonsense. It is just it does it, you know it's like it's like all, it's like so much of what else they do. If you give it any amount of thought, it just doesn't make sense. And I think that different people are more are more sympathetic to different arguments about it. I think that the I think that the the inability of the federal government to effectively enforce this i think is going to be the strongest hand to play with the average american in that you know hey like they they just they can't do this you know they're not capable they're not capable of doing this in the way that they're telling you that they're going to do it but i think that there's more to it than that but i also think that you know you drop you drop the argument that, that you think is going to convince somebody to the extent that people are convinced by arguments which i think is a whole other you know debate to have i don't really think people are for the most part convinced by arguments um i think people are much more emotionally driven and that's fine i'm not complaining about that it just is what it is but you know use whatever arguments you think are going to be effective when discussing this with people um i find it also very concerning that the state has all of this data and information about us that I'm sure they say they don't keep or they say they do this or that, but I'm deeply, deeply skeptical of any time the federal government tells me that they're looking out for me. So gun background checks, we don't like them. (laughs) I think is the, the short version. I think that this is also one of these things that people say, you know, well, it's a reasonable blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, reasonable is telling like, you know, Joe wife beater that he's, that he specifically is not allowed to own a weapon. You know, it's not making entire classes of people. It's not subjecting law abiding citizens to this, to this bureaucratic 
red tape process. And, you know, and I get the like, well, it's just a quick form. It takes you five minutes to fill out. It's like, I don't care. I don't care that it, that it's not that much of an inconvenience. I mean, my skin crawls like every time I fill one of these out. I hate filling these things out um, because I just find it so intrusive. And, you know, I just, I don't like them. I don't like background checks for all the reasons that I have illuminated in this episode. But what I do like is buying ammo online. And that is uh, my prerogative largely due to the 1986 firearm owners protection act i think that's going to be like a new thing on this show where i just only refer to the 1986 gun control act as the 1986 firearm owners protection act because i know that that probably is going to rankle some people but i would urge you to look into it and ask yourself if you would rather own a gun in 1985 or 1987 and i think that the answer is pretty pretty cut and dried on that but if you want to order some ammo online which i would strongly recommend that you do because you can get really good deals ammo.com forward slash podcast will add to these deals and that will give you 20 dollars off any order of 200 dollars or more obviously the rub right now is what we got in changes from day to day, but I'll tell you this. I checked two days two days ago, literally, because we recorded our last two episodes two days ago. And I was like, wonder what they got in for 38 special. Because I keep kind of eyeballing 38 specials because it's, you know, was the police duty weapon for blah blah blah. And it's like, yeah, it'd be kind of cool to own a little 38 special wheel gun. Um, but we have got it. Not much in the way of bulk but we've got 79 boxes of 50 round 132 grain fmj ammo and we have 78 boxes of 20 round 110 grain frangible ammo that's just for 38 special let's see what else we got kicking around while we're at it um nine millimeter (laughs) people like nine millimeters right so i'm told we we got Woo, if we got nine millimeter, we got thousand round boxes of uh, 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 of it sitting around for you. Ain't going to be cheap because no ammo is these days, but it's going to be a lot less than what you're going to pay probably at wherever you're buying it. Again, that's ammo.com forward slash podcast. $20 off any order of $200 or more. I am Sam Jacobs. I want to thank everyone again for joining us on the Resistance Library podcast. For Dave Trello, we will see you next time.